All right, so I got the recorder on and I'm going to start, even though about, uh, I would say, one, less than one third of the class is here. <clears throat> All right, so today's class is about the exam in spring 2023, but this discussion may help you with the homework assignment as well. So this is both your for studying for the final exam and also to help you with your homework assignment, you know, maybe just a little bit. Um, this is from last semester. This is the actual final exam from last semester. Um, the idea is you are given a C program, okay? So the C code <clears throat> is appended at the end of everything. So let me see if I can, come on, okay. All right, so that doesn't work because I have to change this menu. There we go. So if you go to, oh, okay, that's not what I want to do. Uh, I want to get to the last page. I suppose we can do it this way. It's a longer. All right, so on the last page of your pile of paper is the actual C code. So my uh, recommendation is to kind of you know, take it out of the pile so they can look at the C code the entire time. Uh, so it really helps to kind of you know, map the C control structure, especially in this case, we have nested con conditional statements. So it really helps to kind of map this to the assembly code. So I would you know, put this on the left-hand side of your desk <clears throat> or your right-hand side if you're a lefty um, and be able to reference the actual C code and see the structure in the C code the entire time, okay? But that's just my advice, okay? This is gonna be on the last page of the pile of paper that I will, that I will give you. Um, if I staple it, you'll just kind of take it out and then you put it on the side. So the actual question <clears throat> is, the, is the first few pages, okay? The first page for the most part is just instruction. Um, you know, when does the exam start? You know, no collaboration is allowed. You can use anything that's on paper. So it can be anything that you have printed. It can be coming from my notes. It can be the sample programs we have done in class. It can be the solution of the homework assignments. It doesn't matter. It can be a screenshot, you know, from a video recording of this, of the lecture. So you can bring anything on paper, okay? You can also handwrite your own notes, bring that with you, okay? I would actually recommend that as well. <clears throat> um, the C code is um, not faulty. In other words, the C code is guaranteed to work. Okay, I have tested that already. The assembly code, on the other hand, is not okay, okay? There are various types of problems in the assembly code, and your job is to identify, explain, and fix those bugs in the assembly code. Is that okay so far? Does everybody understand in general what you need to do in the final exam? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so I will show you how to document the changes. You know, in other words, you know, instead of reading out you know, everything here, I'll just show you, okay, how to indicate your know, changes to the code. So now we are starting with the actual start, you know, uh, entry code of the program on line 53, which is now at the top of your screen. <clears throat> we start with a NOAA instruction. This is how we initialize the stack pointer to zero. So do not make changes unless it is a problem. This is not a problem. It does the same thing as a LDI D0, except you know, this one uses a subtract instruction. I save one byte, okay, of memory locations, you know, using sub DD instead of LDI D with a zero. But it is not wrong, so do not change code that is not wrong. Now, can you comment it? Can you say, oh, okay, I think this does the same thing as LDI D0? Yeah, you can comment as much as you want, okay? Commenting is not a problem. But when I see an attempt to change the code, then I will have to ask, okay, is this the right place to make a change? Um, and then we have decrement D, you know, LD, LDI A dot five plus, STDA, JMPI to main, and then a halt. So in this case, you know, this is also correct because I have decrement D before the LDI instruction. So when you're counting the number of bytes from the LDI instruction all the way to the halt instruction, it is five. So dot five plus is not wrong here. So do not change that. 
Are we good so far? Does everybody understand when I say do not change code that is correct to begin with? It may not be the same sequence of instructions that we normally use in class, but if it accomplishes the same thing in the end without causing any additional problem, then do not change it because any unnecessary changes or incorrect changes will cost you points. Is that okay? All right, okay. <clears throat> So moving on, uh, on line 61 all the way to line 66, that's the um, actual definition of what a node is as a structure. So node underscore V is the first member of a node. It has an offset of zero from the beginning of the structure and so on. So you have to check whether the definition is correct or not. So there's no guarantee that any part of the program is going to be correct. So you have to be really be sure that these definitions are done correctly. So in the original C code, L is the next member. Um, so L, as a, you know, the offset to member L is the offset to member V plus the size of member V. Okay, that seems to be okay. <clears throat> member R is the last member. It is next to member L. So member R, the offset to member R is the offset to member L plus the size of member L which is also just one byte because those are all pointers and every pointer stores an address. We only need to store one byte in, as an address in TTP. And then node size is, is basically a representation of how many bytes do we need for, for every node. And that would be the offset to the last member, which is R, plus the size of the member R, which is also just one byte because it is also a pointer. Do we have any questions about line 68 to line 71? Okay, I did not see any questions. All right, so let's move on. <clears throat> line 73 defines a macro num nodes, which literally just means, okay, in C or C++, it means every time we see num nodes, it's really the same thing as just seeing the numerical value of five. So line 75 is the equivalent definition to the pound defined or the macro definition. On line 77, we have the uh, prototype or the entry point of insert as a function. So this is where it is helpful to have the C code on the side so that you can actually look at the structure of the C code. So what I want to do here is to say, okay, we got two parameters, PN and PP attach. And then we, I want to find out, you know, where on the stack can I find various items? And the idea is, you know, all of these are expressed as offset from where the stack pointer points to. So it might be helpful to draw a picture, okay? So it depends on <clears throat> how, um, how much you like to rely on pictures. So if you want to draw a picture, you know, in terms of the call stack, we know PN is going to be at the uh, highest location because it is pushed first by the caller. And then P, uh, PP attach, I'll just abbreviate it to PPA so I don't have to write as much. And you can do the same thing as long as I know what you're referring to, you can use abbreviation. So PPA is the first parameter which is pushed second and that's why it is at a lower location. And then the last thing that the caller is gonna push is the return address. So the return address is where the stack pointer points to at the entry point of the function. This particular function has no local variables. So that's why LVS is defined to be zero because we have no local variables. So zero byte is being used by the local variables. <clears throat> and then we look at the definition of the labels. Um, register D, which is a stack pointer, points to return address, which means the offset is a zero. Okay, that's correct. Uh, next one is PPA or PP attach. Um, it is right after the return address and the return address takes up one byte. So adding one to the offset to find the return address is where we are gonna find PP attach as a first parameter. And then after that, we should find PN. So PN as an offset is defined to be PPA plus one because PPA has only one byte and PP, a PN is right, now, right next to it. So the label definitions look right to me. So once again, do not assume the labels are defined correctly, okay? So you have to question every single line. 
Okay, so now we are we are allocating for the local variables. So insert underscore LVS is uh, basically zero. So we are basically subtracting zero from the stack pointer. So if you ask, do we really have to do this? The answer is no. But if you ask, is it wrong to do this? The answer is, it is not wrong. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> now, the way I do this is I look at the beginning of the code and then I match the end immediately. So before I even get into the detail of the function, I'm just gonna scroll all the way to the end of the function. And that's gonna be you know, a little bit of a scrolling, okay? So the end of the function is right here. Um, and we're missing something here. This is the end of the entire function. Can somebody tell me what should be at the end of the function? Go ahead. You're not sure. Right, okay, so we need a jump. <clears throat> but it's not just one instruction. We got a few instructions missing here. So this is the symbol that I would use to say that there's something I need to insert here. Okay, something is missing. I need to insert it. <clears throat> and I would also just kind of explain why I need to insert this. Okay, so, uh, okay. I need to turn off the the touch part because you know, it keeps uh let me see which one to turn off i think it's the click and the drag no the drag i th i still need okay we'll see all right so you might want to write down you know in comments and say you'll need to return to the caller so that's why we need to insert this code which starts with LDBD um, increment D JMPB. Okay, so we, I'm missing, I, I was missing three instructions here, and this indicates that I need to put those instructions back here. Um, line 7170 and line 71, they are correct, okay, to match the beginning for allocating. So this is now for the allocating for the local variables. I got none, okay, but the code is not wrong. So I have to leave it here. I cannot just cross it out and say, no, we don't have any local variables. All right, <clears throat> so now that I have matched the beginning of the function to the end of the function, I can now go into the body of the function and start to look at that code. This is where you know, um, it would make sense to me to have the listing of the program in the C code on the side. Because as much as I try to interleave <clears throat> the C code along with the assembly code, it is not easy to look at how they nest. So that's why you know, it is helpful to kind of have the C program actually on the side so you can see from the indentation how the C code is structured compared to the assembly code. <clears throat> All right, so we are starting with line 88, which is what the C code is attempting to do. Um, it's a conditional statement with a certain condition of whether the thing pointed to by PP attached is null or not. If it is not null, we go to the then portion. If it is null, we go to the else portion. That's what the condition is trying to say. <clears throat> so we look at the condition first, okay? So the condition is relying on the, what PP attach is pointing to. So the first line is going to calculate the offset. The second line will get the address. The third line will load a certain thing into register A, and it's asking you to explain what is in the changed register, which is register A in this case. So you have to answer that question. It carries points, you know, when I ask you what is in a certain register. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I am going to <clears throat> move the picture of the stack a little bit out, just so that I have the space for the explanation. So I'm gonna move this up here, which really is where it belongs. So now I have to, but I cannot just say what is in register A because I need to explain how it gets to that point. So that means the explanation has to start with this one here. A has the offset to PPA. A is the address of PPA. So at this point, after one D reference, uh, A is PPA. And then over here, register C is whatever PPA points to. <clears throat> so this will get me full points. If I only write this here, 
that would not get me full points because it doesn't explain how I get to know that register A is PPA at that point. Okay, so I need to track all the way back to how I got <coughs> PPA into register A to begin with. So is that okay? Does everybody understand what I'm trying to explain here? Because I need to know how you reason to the point where you can explain it. All right. So line 93 is AND CC, which is all, all it does is to force whatever the content pointed to by PPA, which is in register C, through the ALU so they can change the flags in the ALU. <clears throat> and then we have a JZI to insert else zero. So this part has to do with the control structure. The way I would check the control structure is to look at the structure itself because I have an if then else statement here, which means <clears throat> I need to go to the end of the then portion, make sure it has a condition unconditional branch to get to the end of the conditional statement. I also need to make sure that insert underscore uh, else zero is indeed defined at the right place for the else portion of this conditional statement. So to do that, I'm going to look forward, okay? You know, and one thing that might be helpful to you is to remember where you were before so that you know where to go back to. Um, so I am just going to <clears throat> put a little check mark here to remind myself you know, where I was, you know, and I'm just checking out the labels right now. So I'm just gonna scan forward until I find the label definition of <clears throat> L's zero. And it is on line 179, right here, okay? So that means whatever is right before belongs to the then statement corresponding to the outermost conditional statement. At the end of the then statement, I need to have an unconditional branch to the end of the entire conditional statement. So now I need to go forward again to make sure that label is in fact also defined. So I need to go forward to find, in this case, um, insert and if zero. So I go forward and it is defined on line 167 right here. So this time I, am, I have just verified the structure of the outermost conditional statement to be okay. Okay. Are there any questions about what I just did? It's a little bit, sorry, go ahead. Um, in a different way or in the same way? Hmm? There's no error. Yeah, but but if I miss a label definition or I miss the unconditional branch at the end of the then branch, then I would have to fix it. So in this case, I don't have a problem. You know, those were not a part of the problem, but I have to check everything. Is that okay? And I do it you know, by in terms of structure. So when I encounter a control structure like a loop or a conditional statement, I make sure the entire structure is correct before I go into the detail of that structure, control structure, to check everything else. All right, so now that everything is good, I need to go back to the previous point, which is where I put a little check mark because I have to remember where that was. So one thing that you might find helpful if you are one of those people who like to have more visual help in the test is you can bring along some post-its, especially those really kind of narrow, the you know, skinny post-its. So you, you can use those, okay, with color coding and whatnot to help you remember you know, where you, you know, where to go back to to resume your uh, exam because you, sometimes you have to look forward a few, a few pages to, just to make sure the structure is correct. <clears throat> so that might be helpful, okay, having those little skinny post-its you know, can be helpful. Having a highlighter can be helpful too, because if you are one of those people who like to highlight and use color coding, that can be helpful when you, you, know, you can mark up you know, all the code here, just so that you can know, okay, where was I and what is this doing here and so on. <clears throat> all right, so we are now back to line 94. It is correct, okay, so we don't have a problem with that one. And then we move on to line 96, which is a nested conditional statement, which is a part of the then, of the outermost conditional statement. So this is where having the C code on the side is really helpful because you can actually use the indentation of the C code to help you understand, okay, so where are we here? Okay, you know, okay, this is the, the context of the then portion 
of the outermost conditional statement, which by itself is also a conditional statement. All right, so this time we are comparing, okay, so this is important, okay? The left-hand side of the comparison refers to member V of the structure that is pointed to by A pointer that in return is pointed to by PP attach. Okay? What did I just say? <laughs> it is member V of the structure that is pointed to by A pointer, which in return is pointed to by PP attach, and PP attach is one of my parameters. So one thing that might be helpful is to draw a picture, okay? Is to say, okay, so what are we dealing with here? So I will draw the picture kind of on the side here. <clears throat> we have a structure. V is one of the members. The structure is pointed to by a pointer. The pointer itself in return is pointed to by PP attach. <clears throat> so that's the scenario that we're looking at. Which, will, which may be helpful later on when you need to track down, okay, so which register has what again? Because when you try to explain to me why a line needs to be fixed, you need to tell me what, why you need to fix that line. What is missing or why is it extra? Why is it too many you know, of these things or not? So you have to kind of keep all of those things. So for something like this, okay, this is somewhat, you know, it's not complicated, but it just needs a lot of tracking. It's tedious, okay? So even I will have to kind of go like, okay, let's find out what these things are. So B is an offset to find PN, and then I try to dereference it. Okay, can I do this? Can I dereference the offset to something that lives on the stack? It is an offset from where the stack pointer points to. So that means it is quote unquote floating based on where the stack point is pointing to without integrating the stack pointer into the whole calculation, I do not have the address. So that means at this point, I really should not be dereferencing it because when you're, when you're dereferencing something, it better be the address of something. And I don't have the address of something, I have the offset of something that lives on the stack. So that means, okay, it's time to do a insert here, um, I need <clears throat> LD, oh, I need add, okay, so back, oh, no, 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 okay, sorry, okay, I meant undo, not going back to the previous page, and it doesn't seem to be undoing that, okay, fine, just delete and rewrite the whole thing, so what I need here is add, B, B, and after that, B becomes the address of PN. <clears throat> Is that okay? Because you cannot dereference an offset, you can only dereference an address. If you have an offset to get to the address, you have to add the stack pointer to that thing. All right, so now that we have the address, I can do a dereference, so after the dereference, now B is indeed just your parameter PN. And parameter PN based on the type is a pointer to a structure. So that means PN, or what is in register B now, is the address of a structure. So what I do next is to load <clears throat> A is the offset to member B. So after I add the offset to a certain member and I add it to the address of the entire structure, which is in register B, what do I have? How do I describe what is in register B on line 100 at this point? So this is the kind of stuff that, help, that will help you with your homework assignment because your homework assignment has stuff that is somewhat along the same line, okay? You need to refer to members of a structure and the structure is pointed to by a pointer and so on and so forth. So what do I have now? Register A is the offset to member V from the beginning or from the address of a structure. 
and the member and the register B is A is the address of a structure because that's what the parameter PN is supposed to do. It is the address of a structure. When I add those two, what do I get? What is the sum? What is what is it representing? Go ahead. Not the value. Hmm? The position or the address. Yep. Yep, you're correct. It is the address of member V of the structure that is pointed to by PN. Okay? <clears throat> in English, it is long, but in C++ notation, it's not that bad. It is the address of Tn points to V. In other words, the way we say this is really kind of awkward because you know, when you read a C uh, expression, it goes from left to right most of the time, but it doesn't sound right you know, when we express it that way. So the way I express this is kind of backwards. It is it's the address of member V of the structure that is pointed to by Pn. So that's the way I would put it. All right. <clears throat> and the next thing we want to do is to add C to A. So we go like, wait, where is C? Where do we define C, you know, in this code here? Okay. In other words, if you look at this scope here from line 96 to line 101, we didn't define C in any way. It's not initialized. But how did we get here? Well, we got here because we did not take the JZI branch. Okay, if we did not take the JZI branch, that means your C is not null, but what if C is not null, what is it? Read my own code here, C is whatever PPA is pointing to. PPA points to a particular pointer, which is also pointing to um, <clears throat> the structure. In other words, this is PPA, this is you know, what PPA points to, this thing is in register C right now. So register C is the address of a structure, and I'm adding register A, which is still um, the offset from the beginning of a structure to, in this case, member V. So once again, I have now the address of member V, but in this case, of a structure that is pointed to by A pointer that in return is pointed to by PPA, which is what this picture here is trying to show you. All right, so I'll be okay with that. Okay, let me write it down first, you know, and then you can check whether you are okay with that statement. C is now the address of PPA points to V. <clears throat> All right, is that okay? Does everybody understand <clears throat> on line 100, 101, why, oh, okay, I used the wrong register. Okay, this is register A. Why register A is the address of member V of the structure that is pointed to by a pointer, which in return is pointed to by PPA. In other words, <laughs> going to, back to this picture, we're looking at the address of member V that is in the structure that is pointed to by a pointer, which has no name, which in return is pointed to by PPA. Are we okay with that understanding? So if not right now, what you might want to do is to kind of jot down in your own notes. It's like, okay, I need to go back to those lines and revisit the concept because it might take you a little bit longer after class to really let this entire thing sink in. Um, I can also give you this code that is completely corrected. So you can just run it through um, your know, Logisim. You can run it, you, know, you can do the trace. You can then take a look at exactly how things are calculated. But at this point, I'm just going to move forward, okay? Because otherwise we won't be able to get this done. So we dereference B, okay? So B is now without the address of, because we just dereference the address. So it really is just the value of member V of the structure that PN points to. <clears throat> and then we do the same thing with A. Register A is now, this is a little bit harder to pronounce, you know, to spell out in words. 
register A is now the value of member V of the structure that is pointed to by A pointer, which in return is pointed to by PPA. Is that okay? So if you're having difficulty understanding these concepts, what you probably need to do is to really go back and look at how, look at the notation in C or C++, what is a pointer? What does it mean when I use the, uh, the emperor's and symbol? What does it mean when I use the pointer symbol? You know, because you know, that is the key to understand all of this stuff here. This is basically you know, um, C code, but you're also uh, relating the C code to assembly programming concepts. All right, so we are comparing A to B. So everything is up to this point is fine, okay? We are not missing anything. Compare A, B is correct because after all, this is what the comparison is trying to do. So compare A, B means you know, we are subtracting B from A. So we are subtracting uh, B is the right-hand side from A, which is on the left-hand side. So now we have a, a JCI, you know, which means, you know, we, we want to go to the then portion, okay? The then portion of the then portion inside insert, that's what the, this is the way I structure the label name. When you see insert then zero, then zero, the zero is only here in case I have multiple conditional statements at the same level. The reason why we have then zero and then and then zero is because this label, okay, insert then zero and then zero, is corresponding to the entry point of the then statement that in return, the entire conditional statement is also in the then statement of the outermost conditional statement. So that's why there's a little nesting implied by the name of the label. But the key here is I want to find a reason to go to the then portion. According to the C code, we go to the then portion. If the left-hand side is less than the right-hand side, the left-hand side is read in register A, the right-hand side is in register B. So JCI is not entirely correct only for one reason. Can someone tell me why JCI is the wrong kind of conditional branch in this case? Or how do I make sure JCI is the right one? What is the alternative that I might want to consider using? That's the question. What do you think? <clears throat> how do we know after a comparison that the min of n is less than the subtrahend in a, after a binary subtraction. Okay, we got two hands. Uh, go ahead. Okay, and go ahead. We should use JL, right? Because you know, the L flag, the L flag is invented for one purpose only. It indicates whether the min of n is less than the subtrahend in a signed subtraction. Okay, that's the only reason why we have L. So the reason why this has to be changed to LJLI instead of JCI is because member V is a signed integer. It is not an unsigned integer. So that's why we have to make a change here. Okay, so to make that change, I just cross this out and say JL. I, and then I have to explain it, V is signed. So any change without an explanation is not going to get full points because, you know, I need to know why you make that change. All right, so, okay, that's all good. And if I don't make that branch, you know, it means it is not less than, then I should go to the else statement of the nested conditional statement that is in the then portion of the outer conditional statement. That is how the labels are created, okay? You know, it is a very structured way to come up with the name of these labels. And I promise you that I would not mislead you by using your know, label names that are just misleading. So the label names always indicate what they're supposed to be indicating. All right, so now we go to the actual then portion of the nested conditional statement. Um, which, has, which consists of a single return statement. But the return statement is the result of calling insert, you know, which is a recursive call. So now we take a look at this portion and see what we can make out of, you know, can we detect problems here. 
All right. So the first thing we need to do is not to deal with the return. We have to call the subroutine first. When we call a subroutine, we always push the parameters or push the arguments. Um, you know, last one is push first, and then we push the first one. So, um, but it doesn't have to happen that way. Okay, the way I evaluate the arguments can be in any order. It's just that when we push those things on the stack, we have to push the second argument first and then to push the first argument. So the ordering on the stack is important, but the actual evaluation of, or when I evaluate is not as important. So now I have to track, you know, what is in each register again. Okay, so we have A is offset to member L in this case, and I'm adding register A to register C. It's like, oh, okay, what is in register C, register C right now? Can someone tell me? What was the last time, okay, based on what is shown on the screen right now, what is the last line that made changes to register C? Sorry? 90. To your correct, okay. So not line ninety two was the last time we did an update to register C, which means by the time we got here, register C is still whatever PPA points to. PPA is my parameter. It points to something that is in return a pointer to a structure, which means register C still has the address of a structure. When I add the offset of a member to the address of a structure. I get the address of the member in that structure. So that means <clears throat> at this point, C is the address of PPA, asterisk, asterisk PPA points to, in this case, member L. It's not member V anymore, okay, because I loaded um, the offset from the beginning of a structure to member L into register A. So by adding register A to the address of a structure, now we get the address of the member. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> and then we do another load here. Okay, so that means at this point, register C is going to be really just the member itself, the value of the member. And then we, okay, so that by itself is not wrong. Okay, but we have to see what we are doing with register C later on. And then we continue with B is, uh, this is the stack offset, okay, to PN, because PN is a parameter, it lives on the stack. And then at this point, B is the address of PN. Okay, so it would appear to me that I'm not making further changes to register uh, C or register B. So now we have to see what, how we are using those. The next two instructions on line 114 and line 15, we are pushing register B on the stack. And that would be corresponding to pushing the second argument on the stack. Do we have a problem? What am I supposed to push on the stack? As this, what is the second argument to call insert? PN, right? Do you see it is the address of PN? Is it an Empress N in front of PN? No, but yet register B is just the address of PN. So that means hmm, something is not right here. How do I fix the problem? We're expecting PN to be in register B when we push it. But by the time we push it, we only have the address of PN in register B. So what do I need to do to fix this problem? Dereference it. And in this case, it is in the form of a load instruction. So load. Register B with register B, which will turn B into actually just PN. That's how we fix the problem, okay? But you have to show me what you know before the fix, which is saying, okay, we got close, but we are not quite getting the right thing into register B. We need that one extra LDBB in order to turn register B into PN. Then we are okay with pushing it because it's the second argument. And then what do we do? Um, let's see. So, and then what we do is we decrement D again and then store something into what register D is pointing to, which means we're pushing. 
and we're pushing register C because it's the first argument. Do we have a problem with the first argument? Well, okay, what is in the C code? The C code says we're supposed to push the address of member L of the structure that is pointed to by a pointer that in return is pointed to by, that is pointed to by PPA, the PP attach. Okay, that's what we're expecting in C. What is in register C itself? It is not the address of, it is the actual value of member L. So how do I fix this problem? Okay, I think you know the answer. No, maybe not, okay. We got one too many dereference because in order to get to the value of something, you have to get to the address first. So that means, hey, if I can get to the value of something, I have to get to the address first and that's all I need. This line here on line 111 is not needed. It is, it's an extra dereference that I really do not need. So we cross it out, okay, so we go here. And then we cross this out and we say um, only the address is needed. So that's how we you know, denote this, this line should not be here, okay? This is doing something that we really should not be doing because we only need the address, not the value of the member. All right, so with that also fixed, you know, pushing register B is okay. And now we get onto the, the messy one uh, line 118. It has got a few problems, okay? Um, the first problem, so what you do in this case is you can basically just kind of circle the entire thing and say, okay, I think we need a dot six plus here. So plus plus, you know, two plus list, plus two pluses is not okay. And the offset is also wrong. Why do we need a dot six plus and not a dot five here? because from the perspective of the LDI instruction, where we need to go to, which is the increment D instruction right after JMPI, it's six bytes away. How is it six bytes away? I'm gonna use the pointer, so this way when you review this you know, in the video, you know how to do it too. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it has to do with all the instructions ending with an I, take up two bytes, everything else only take up one byte. So we need to make sure that we load the return address, which is the address of the instruction right after the JMPI into the register and six bytes, it is six bytes away from where the LDI instruction is. So that's why we have to fix the expression here and basically just go like, okay, the five should be a six, you know, get rid of the two plus, turn it into one single plus. Is that okay? All right, so in this case, it's part of a syntax problem and part of a, you know, offset issue. All right, so we, when we get back, you know, we, yes, go ahead. Huh? What about the plus plus? That's not okay. Yeah, we, we only need one plus because we are only calculating what is the sum of the dot and the six. So the second plus has nothing to operate on because we have no we, we don't have two values on the to, in order for that second plus to occur. Yep. All righty. So when we are done, um, oh. So I forgot one thing, but you know I, I'm catching it now. So this is the only thing I have to do. The return statement is the only thing I have to do in the nested conditional statement as a part of the then statement of the outer conditional statement, this is the end of it, okay? The end curly brace is marking the end of the then branch and it has an else branch here. Wait, hold on a second here. So that means after the end of the then portion, I just kind of fall right through to whatever the else branch has to do. So what am I, am I missing something? And what am I missing? So this goes back to how we compile conditional statement. At the end of the then branch, we have to go around the entire else branch, and that is missing here. So what we need is here is a JMPI to the end of the nested conditional statement that is a part of the then branch of the outer conditional statement. So I need to find out what the, you know, where it is. But based on the naming convention, I can probably just 
you know, just say, okay, this is the label is probably called insert, <clears throat> then zero, because that is the containing a statement. But we are looking for the end of the conditional statement corresponding to the current nested conditional statement. So that is likely to be the name of that label, okay? But I want to double check and make sure. So I'm going to go forward, okay? Once again, you know, if you want to remember where you were, because we have to kind of do a page down, just leave yourself a little uh, breadcrumb so you can get back to that point. So I just go forward and go, can we find that label, which is insert then zero and zero, and we found it on line 154. Okay, that's good. Okay, we got the label defined, and we just have to insert an unconditional branch so that we get to that point. All right, so we get back to the little check mark to make sure that, okay, yeah, we are good up to this point. So on lines, uh, line 127 or line 26 in the C code, that is corresponding to the beginning of the then portion of the nested conditional statement, which is a part of the you know, outer conditional statement, the then branch of the outer conditional statement. So now, you know, so once again, okay, you know, having the C code on the side is really helpful because the C code will give you a much better picture of how things are nested. And then you can go like, oh, okay, this is corresponding to line blah, blah, you know, in the C code, okay? But it's up to you to make that mapping, okay? You know, you can, you can, you can write down anything you want. You can basically say this is line blah, blah in the C code to remind yourself where you are in the C code. But it really is helpful to have the C code on the side. All right, so the C code is going to say, um, for the else branch of the nested conditional statement that is in the then portion of the outer conditional statement, it, what it wants to do is another conditional statement. So this is triple nested, okay, into the, okay, double nested, I should say, into the then portion, into the, okay. This is the, Okay, here we have the else of the nested conditional statement, which is in the then portion of the outermost conditional statement. This is, and which consists of its own conditional statement. So this is like three levels deep in terms of nesting. What we want to do is to compare again and see whether this thing is greater than that thing. We go like, um, how can that possibly be done using a single JZI instruction. What about the compare? What about putting stuff into the registers in order to compare? So now the question that you have to ask is, how do we get here in the first place? How do we get to the label of insert then zero, else zero? How do we get here? So you have to go all the way back <laughs> to the conditional branch that ends up over there. So the conditional branch that ends up, end up over there is on line 106. This is how we got to the label of insert then zero, else zero. And at that point, can someone tell me what is in register A and what is in register B and what have we just done before line 106? Okay, all you have to do is to read your own comment, okay? So this is why you have to comment the code because if I didn't do that, I would have forgotten what I have written down here already. So by the time we compare, register A has basically the left-hand side of the comparison. Um, register B has the right-hand side of the comparison. And we end up at the label insert then zero else zero because A is not less than B. Because if A was less than B, I would have gone to this portion of the code starting at line 109. So that means by the time we get to the label that I just mentioned earlier, which is the else label right here, okay? By the time we get to line 125, it means you know, we have just done the comparison and A is not less than B. That's the only thing we can assert by the time we get to line 126 or one, line 125, doesn't matter which line because one line is a comment. So what do we do at that point? We just have to say, Okay, if I were to comment, okay, you don't have to do this, but I want to do this. So I would say at this point, what we know is um, A is not less than B, 
register A is not less than B, because that's the only reason why would we, we would end up here. But register A still contains this portion of the comparison. Register B still contains that portion of the comparison because we did not make any changes to register A, registers A or B by the time we get here. So that means, why do I want to reload everything into register B, A and register B when they are, they are still here? So I also do not need an extra compare because the extra compare is not going to give you anything new because we just did a compare between register A and register B. So we can just say, okay, we'll just take a look at some other flags you know, after the compare to see whether the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side. Well, if it's not less than, you only got two choices left. It's either equal to or greater than, right? Does that make sense? After a compare, you have three possible results, less than, equal to, or greater than. If it's less than, we got that case already handled. So we only got equal to or greater than as the possibility. So now what I do is I just do a JCI to say, hey, if it's equal to, let's go to this else zero, else zero, then else, then zero, else zero, else zero, which is corresponding to the else branch of the else branch of the then branch from the beginning for, from the outermost portion of the program because that means it's not greater than. So by the time we get to line 130, it means it is greater than. Register A is greater than register B, which means, you know, okay, now we need to, you know, implement um, what is commented out on line 129, which is calling insert again, but this time we are pushing PN and also pushing the address of the R member of the structure that is pointed to by a pointer, which in return is pointed to by PP attach. It is a long way to describe it, but it is the correct way to describe it. Okay. But you can see that this time the code looks a little bit different the way I do the calculation. So we have to kind of go through this calculation again. So B is the offset to PN. B is the address of PN. And then we push it on the stack, right? So that means we're pushing the wrong thing on the stack because according to the C code, we're supposed to be pushing PN on the stack and register B only has the address of PN. Okay, so that means we have to insert um, LD, B, B here. So the B is actually PN before we push it on the stack. And then we uh, put node underscore R into B. <clears throat> so B is offset to member R. And then we add C to B. So you have to remember what is in register C at this point. So you have to go all the way back because you know, right now register C still contains the pointer that is pointed to by PPA. Because in order to get here, so you have to kind of remember how to get, how we end up being here in the first place. Um, but I'm just gonna see, you know, I'm, I would just say that register C still has asterisk PPA at this point. So that means register B is now the address of this thing. I'll spell it out and say it you know, in just a moment, like now. So register B is now containing the address of member R of the structure that is pointed to by a pointer that in return is pointed to by PPA. And PPA or PP attach is one of my parameters. All right. Okay. So at this point, okay, you're going like, okay, how do we track all those labels, blah, blah, blah. You can use a graphical way to do it. So I'm going to start from the beginning. Um, so... I'm not sure whether this will work here, but I will give it a try. So what you do is you start with the JZI, and then you draw a line to where the label is. So we know it has to go, oops, further down. 
and I'm looking for that label. Did I pass get past it? Yeah, I just went past it, didn't I? Yep. All right, so uh, let's see. Maybe erase this part. And it goes like, yeah. That's how we got here. Is that okay? And then you look at the other conditional branch, which is on line 128, and then you go to the label corresponding to that else zero, else zero. But basically, that is how you track it, okay? Which also means, you know, in order to get to line 135, you go backwards and you ask, how did we get here? We got to line 125 because of the conditional branch from way above. And at that point, okay, when I perform that branch all the way to line 125, register C still has asterisk PPA. So that is how you track, you know, the registers. All righty. <clears throat> all right. So we push the right thing on the stack, but at this point, we are not pushing it correctly on the stack. There is one thing wrong with uh, the push on line 137, because at this point, P is, oh, this one is actually correct. Never mind, I correct myself. Okay, because we are really just trying to push the address of member R of the structure that is pointed to by a pointer that in return is pointed to by PPA because of the ampersand here. So what we have in register B is correct because it is the address of, so we don't have a problem in this case. We push it on the stack and then we calculate the return address. So this time the return address is incorrect because I do the decrement D first. So I have to fix this, the entire expression and change it to dot five plus because we have the decrement D first this time. Or you can simply look at it as, okay, how far is the increment D on line 142 away from you know, LDI? So we can do the counting again. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So that's why we have a five here. The six is incorrect. Are we still doing okay so far? Yep. You switch the what? You, oh, you've been switching with the previous one? Well, the plus plus is still wrong. I mean, that's just wrong syntax. Yeah, so you know, just kind of fix each one individually, you'll be fine. Okay, all right. All right, so um, we are now at the end of a branch. At the end of a then branch, we do have an unconditional branch to the end of that corresponding you know, uh, conditional statement. So that's good. You might want to double check the uh, label does exist because I can still give you a problem like, okay, I'm going to the right label, but it's not defined. Then you have to define the label. You have to find out where it is supposed to be defined. This is the else branch, which only has to return a zero, which is just loading, reg uh, loading zero into register A. That's all we need to do. And the label is pretty easy this time because this branch just kind of goes here, right? You know, the, because that's the same label. <clears throat> no, it is not. Okay, never mind. It is not the same label. All right, this is the label. We go here. So these things can be helpful. Okay, you know sometimes you know these arrows will span across pages, which means you know if you have color coding, you know that can be helpful, or having those little post-its, you know that can be helpful too. All right, and that's about the entire thing for uh, insert. Yep, because we checked, okay, the reason why we don't have to check anything else is because you know we checked all the label definitions as we process the structure. So that's why by the end, by the time we get to the end of the structures, the control structures, that's already checked by this time. All right, any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna finish this whole thing, and then you know, um, at that time, you know, we'll I'll go over what you can do to prepare for the exam. All right, so all of this stuff is pretty much done, but I still want to double check. 
um, because we still have this else statement here that is not checked yet. The control structure is checked, but not the actual content inside the else. So at this point, we want to implement this, and we have the offset. We have the aha. I'm dereferencing an offset again. So what do we need in between? Okay, so let me just comment you know, and explain what problem we have here. B is an offset to PN. And the next statement on line 162 is trying to dereference it. So what am I missing here? We have to turn it into an address, but how do we do that? How do we turn an offset to a certain thing from where the stack pointer points to, to an actual address? Add, okay, add is correct. Add the stack pointer to the offset. So what we need is add, in this case, B, D, and that will turn B into the address of PN. Because the label itself is just the offset from where the stack pointer points to, to the thing that I need. So if I just have the offset, it's not gonna help me. It's just like you're know, saying that, you know, Miriam lives your five, your five houses down from where I live, okay? So if you tell the UPS driver, it's like, okay, it's five streets down from where Tech lives. The UPS driver goes like, that doesn't help me because I still need to know where Tech is living at. So the stack pointer is pointing to where I live. So now combining the stack pointer and the offset, we can now access items that are expressed as an offset from where the stack pointer points to. So that's why we need that. So by the time we get to the LD instruction, uh, we have the address, which is okay to the reference, okay? So now B is actually PN. And we just store that to whatever register A has. It's like, is that right? Okay, who is setting register A? So now you have to ask, how did we end up at insert else zero? Okay, so this can be, <laughs> the concept of a tunnel can be helpful, or you can just look up, you know, where did we do a branch to insert else zero? So I'm gonna put a check mark here just so that I know where I'm supposed to get back to. So it has to be way up there, okay? Because you know, the shorter the label, the earlier the reference or definition is. So um, JZI to insert L's and zero is on line 94. So that means that picture, oh, this is the wrong link. Okay, never mind. I have to erase this again. This is the wrong thing. It actually goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, this goes all the way, come on, down, down, down to L's zero. There we go. Okay, yep. Right here. Register D is our stack pointer. It is always our stack pointer. So, you know, um, after the, our discussion of the stack, you know, register D, the only purpose of register D has always been just the stack pointer. It cannot do anything else. Okay? All right. So, getting back to this picture, okay, it is. A little convoluted. It's harder to do on the tablet. If you were to do this on the piece of paper, it's actually easier. But now the question is, <clears throat> if you look at line 94, at that point, what is in register A? According to line 91, register A is PPA, which is our parameter. So now when you go all the way back to where we are currently at, then you have, then you have to ask, am I overwriting whatever PPA is pointing to, yeah, that sounds about right, okay? Because register A is PPA, and the ST instruction overwrites not PPA itself, it overwrites what PPA points to, hence the parentheses around register A, so that's perfectly okay, okay? So if I were to comment this line here, it is doing exactly what the C code is trying to do, which is that. So it's all, it's all good. 
at this point, we return a one um, and loading a one into register A is how we return the value of one. So now we are all done with insert, which is you know, a function. All right, so now we move on to main. So as a part of main, we have the static local variable. A static local variable does not live on the stack, okay? It lives you know, in the same space as our global variables. So that's why the way we define the initialized uh, static local variable nodes is really the same way that we define any initialized global variables. So that means you know, 500 in the C code is 500 in assembly code. The zero is a pointer here, okay? But you know, in assembly code, in TDP, the address has exactly just one byte. So that's why we just use byte zero to define an address that is zero. Um, seven zero zero, and if you scroll down, you know, I believe this portion is correct entirely. So we have three zero zero matching this three zero zero one zero zero to match this one zero zero, and then nine zero zero to match that nine zero zero. So we are good here. All right. So getting to main. <clears throat> main is a little bit tricky. There are a few local variables. So if you look at the C code, you know, it actually includes the definition of the local variables. Uh, we have a local, okay, let me switch to the C code so that you can see what I mean by that. Um, all right, so this is the C code of main. So when you look at main, you know, the, uh, the static one, you know, which is notes, is not a part of the stack. It is not on the stack. The parts that are on the stack is P root, which is a pointer to a struct node, P node, which is also a structure of an, which is also a pointer to a struct node. And then we have just an unsigned AB integer, which is called counter. So those are the three extra things that I need to allocate, you know, when we do it in assembly code. So when we switch back to the assembly code at the entry point of main, this is how I define the labels to get to those individual items. The frame of main, if you want to draw a frame, at the highest address is the return address. The return address is uh, pushed on the stack by the caller, which is the entry code of the entire program. And then we have the local variables. Now the ordering of the local variables is, it can be somewhat arbitrary as long as you know, together they have the same, has the right amount of space. So in this case, I am putting P root all the way down here. I'm putting P node right next to it on top, and then I'm adding, I'm putting counter here. And after the frame is set up, I need register D to be pointing here. This is after the frame is set up. However, before the frame is entirely set up, at the entry point of main, the caller is going to put register D pointing to the return address. So that means the subroutine, the function itself, is responsible to decrease the stack pointer to reserve for the local variables. That code is missing. In other words, I have done all the calculation correctly that main requires you know, this number of bytes you know, on the stack for its local variables. But I don't have any code here to actually do the allocation. So that means I need to insert that code. So I'm going to insert um, LDI A main LVS. And I need to subtract that much away from the stack pointer to allocate for the local variables. So this is for allocating for the local variables. And then right away, I go straight to the end to make sure I have a matching D allocation, which is entirely missing here. So I also need to put that code here, LDI. This time I use B because register A has the return value of main. So main LDS. This time I have to add that much to the stack pointer to deallocate the local variables. So this is for deallocating the local variables. All right, so with that done, now I can proceed with you know, what is inside the main function. All right, so we are looking at line 209 right now. B is the right-hand side in this case, just a zero. Okay, that's fine. Um, register A is the left-hand side. 
So we put the offset of P root into register A, and then we calculate the address, and then we store to the address. Yeah, that looks right to me. So lines 209 to 212 is okay. Um, and then we initialize the counter. <coughs> Um, register B still has zero in it because we haven't really changed the value of register B. So that means I just have to get the offset of counter, get to the address of counter, and then store to that address with a zero. We're good. So lines 214 to 216, they are correct as well. So now we look at line 218, um, or 217 is the C code. So what we are doing here is we are trying to get to the address of one element past the end of the array nodes. Because you know, we know nodes has num nodes many structures, but when you use that number as the index, you are getting past the end of the entire array because the end of the array should have number of items in the array minus one as the index. This is just past that. So we are calculating the address of that particular uh, element in the array by looking at the address of nodes itself, and then we compute the product between number of nodes and how big each node is. This is the product. When this is all done, then we perform the addition, which is the address of nodes and <clears throat> the number of bytes you know, of all the nodes in the array. So that is the correct way to compute the address of the element that is just past the end of the entire array. Is that still doing okay so far? Yep. Huh? It is postfix. Yep, all the expressions you know, are postfix in TDP ASM. Okay, so that looks right to me. That's the right hand side. The left hand side is uh, calculated on line 219. Line, on line 219a has the offset, then we get the address, and then we get to store to P node. Yep, that seems okay to me. All right, so we are now on to lines, um, uh, line 222, which is the loop. So this is a control structure. As usual, with a control structure, I check the entire structure first. I need a label to mark the beginning of the entire loop so I can get back to that point. That's the job of main underscore while zero. That's good. But I also need an unconditional branch back to that point at the end of the body of the loop. So I'm looking for that at this point. And we do not find it. Because line 255 is the last instruction of the body of the loop. And it does not have an unconditional branch back to the beginning. So we need to add that you know, in the code. So that means here we need an unconditional branch JMPI to main underscore while, okay, how did I, <clears throat> what is the name that I used? Oh. Uh, while zero, okay, so we just have to <clears throat> put an unconditional branch here back to the beginning. We also double check there's a label to mark the end or past the end of the while loop and make sure that we exit you know, to that point. So now we go back here. Okay, so line 222 tells you what the loop is supposed to do. We are just comparing P node to the address of the first element of nodes, which is an array. So we put the left-hand side of the comparison, the right-hand side of the comparison into register B, and this is uh, main nodes is the beginning point of the entire array. Zero is referring to the index here. Node size is how many bytes each node is gonna take up. And we do the product here. The product between zero and node size is still a zero. We add that to the address of nodes, which is still be at the beginning of nodes itself. So that is the correct uh, calculation for the address of the first element of the array nodes. We put it into register B. So the next statement, which is adding the stack pointer to uh, register B, is incorrect because nodes is not on the stack. So that means you know, we have to erase or get rid of line 255 and explain that you know, nodes is not on the 
stack. Because it is a static local variable, it is not a normal auto local variable. All right, so that's the um, left right hand side. The right hand side is just p nodes, the value of p node, which is one of my local variables in main. This is the offset, this is the address, this is p nodes, do the compare, sounds good. Um, JZI, which means when they equal to, because in, when they are not equal to, I stay in the loop. When they do equal to, I need to get out of the loop. So this is the right way to get out of the loop. So we are good so far. And then we have to decrement P node, okay? So when you decrement P node, you have to decrement it by the number of bytes. Oh, okay, yesterday I forgot to catch this one. So I'm gonna catch it this time. Okay, so we are getting to P node first, okay? This is the offset, this is the address, and this is the actual value of P node. So by the time we get to line 236, it is actually P node itself. Um, so let me just write it down. Okay, so this, this is the offset to P node. This is the address of P node. B is P node. Okay, so what is wrong in here is I cannot just subtract one from P node, which is a pointer, because P node is a pointer to a structure so when you increment the pointer or you, when you decrement the pointer, the actual change to the pointer itself is not going to be by one. It is by the size of the structure that it points to. So that means you know, this one should be a node size because uh, P node points to a struct node. So this is really kind of important, okay? You know, when you decrement or increment a pointer to something other than something that whatever you point to, if it's not a single byte, when you increment the pointer or when you decrement the pointer, it, you're changing the pointer to point to the next thing or the previous thing. But since the size of each thing is not just one byte, you cannot just add one or subtract one. You have to add or subtract the size of whatever the pointer is pointing to. In this case, we have a pointer to a struct node. The size of a struct node is represented by the label node size. So we have to change by node size and not just one. Other than that, the code is actually correct because after we do the calculation, we store that uh, decremented, stack, uh, decremented pointer to a no struct node back to wherever you know, uh, P node is, so that is correct. So the rest is actually correct here. Alrighty. So this is something I have to kind of alert my other class because I didn't quite catch this one last time. All right, so what we do next is we decrement D and then we push register B on the stack. And that's perfectly okay because you know, we know register B is P node, okay? If you look at the comment on line 236, register B is the value of P node, even though after we make some changes, it is still consistent because every time we make changes to register B, we also update the memory location of P node. So that means you know, uh, register B continues to be the actual value of P node. So we can do this. Um, since it's asking the question, now we have to say uh, register B is P node. So I'm answering the question left behind in the uh, comment. All right. So now we have to push the address of P root on the stack. And this syntax here is obviously wrong, but that's not the only thing that's wrong. Okay, this plus here is not the only problem. Because we are supposed to push the address of P root on the stack. So normally, you just you know, put the offset into a register, you add the stack pointer to that same register, and you get to the address. But not this time. The reason why this time it's not gonna work is because we just push an extra thing on the stack. So the offset to P root is, uh, is not just the label P root anymore, it is one plus the P root because we just pushed um, an argument on the stack. So we have to use one plus here. That's because you know, we have an, um, the second argument is already pushed. 
So the offset is now off by one. Okay, so I'm going to pause here because this is really important. I want to make sure everybody understand why we need that one plus here. Are we good here? All right, okay. All right, so um, so that's the offset, and then we add the stack pointer to the offset. We get the address of p root, and that's all we want to push on the stack. That is correct. And in this case, your know, uh, dot six plus is correct because we have declaration D after the LDI instruction, and then that's pushing the return address on the stack. We go to the subroutine, and then when it comes back, um, we when it comes back, we are supposed to store that into counter, and I'm forgetting several things here, two things here. So what am I forgetting? We just got back from calling um, insert, okay? Do we still have anything sitting on the stack? What is the caller callee agreement? The caller is supposed to push all the arguments. It pushes the return address. The callee, after it's all done, would pop the return address and then get back to the caller. Do we still have things sitting on the stack? What would that? How many things? How many bytes are still on the stack that I really should get rid of at this point? Two. That's right. Those are the arguments. Okay. So we need two increment d's here. Increment d, increment d, to de allocate the arguments. Okay. So after that, we calculate the address of counter. This is the offset to counter. This is the address of counter. Um, and then we are supposed to add to whatever counter already has according to the C code because it's a plus equal to right here. So I get to offset address. This is the actual value of counter. I add the return value of calling insert to the current value of counter and store that back into the counter. So that is correct, okay, that's all good. This is something that we did earlier when we analyzed the control structure of the while loop earlier. And when the loop is all done, we return the zero to the entry code, which doesn't really do anything useful, but it's there. Um, and then we fix this already because when we analyzed the structure of the function itself, we have already identified that we have to deallocate the local variables. So that's all done already. It has the proper return code back to the entry code. So we are all set here. So main is all done. And that should be the um, solution of this particular exam. All right. Now, we do, we, don't, we do not actually have a lab today. So I can use some extra time to kind of talk about how you can prepare for the final exam. First of all, a lot of the stuff that we talked about here relates to the homework assignment. Okay, Some of you might notice it's like, oh, so that's how it's done. So maybe you get enough clue to kind of implement your uh, traverse homework assignment. The point value of traverse is not that much. Okay, But what you learn in the experience of doing that homework assignment can be very helpful in the final exam. Okay, So that's the first thing. The second thing is, what are you going to do to help you, you know, with your final exam? First of all, it's open book and open notes. So the first question you really want to ask is, what do I want to bring with me to the exam? What do you think is important? <laughs> um, there are certain things that are really kind of more important than others. The caller callee agreement is important. Okay, most of the things that we talked about here has to do with the caller callee agreement. Okay, so what is, can can you kind of outline the caller callee agreement? So everything from you know setting up the arguments, you push the arguments in a reverse order. The last argument is pushed first. Okay, so that means the ordering on the stack is the last argument has the highest address. The first argument has the lowest address, and then you have to push. You, then, then you push the return address. So the return address has the lowest uh, address on the stack, as far as the caller is concerned. When you get to the callee, the callee is responsible to allocate 
for its own local variables and to deallocate for its own local variables. The return value is always going to be stored in register A, and then the callee has no responsibility whatsoever to preserve registers A, B, or C you know, from the caller's perspective. In other words, when you call a subroutine, say bye-bye to all those three registers, okay? Because you cannot rely on those three registers will retain their value when the subroutine returns. The subroutine is also responsible to pop the return address. So that means the caller should not be deallocating the return address. When control gets back to the caller, the caller is responsible to deallocate the arguments, okay? So that's, generally speaking, that's all, it's a quick summary of the caller callee agreement from the perspective of, you know, the assembly code versus the C code. So the other part of this entire preparation has to do with reading expressions, okay? So let me point to certain expressions that can look difficult to interpret, but it really should not be. So let's go to, um, let's see, something like this, okay, which we dealt with several times already in today's lecture. So when you look at something like this, you have to kind of look at it from the perspective of what the computer is going to look, how the computer is going to look at this. When you have nested um, expressions, just regular algebra you know, expressions that has like you know, six levels of parentheses, what do you do? Where do you start? Hmm? In the, the innermost part of the parentheses. And you do the same thing here. Okay, so in the innermost part of the parentheses is PP attach. What do we do with PP attach? Well, we dereference it. What are we doing with the thing after we dereference? Oh, we treat it as a pointer to a structure. That's how you can use the arrow thingy, okay? And then what do we do, okay? Now that we know it is a pointer to a structure and we want to access something in that structure, then you ask, what are we trying to access? Which member are we trying to access, okay? And then you look at the outermost parentheses and you go like, okay, what do we do, what do, we do with that? We want the address of that thing. We don't want the value of that thing. We want the address of that thing. So this is the one part where it is the most confusing transitioning from C or C++ to assembly language is in C or C++, it is quote unquote, an extra work, it's extra work to get to the address that is misleading. Because in assembly code, you always have to get to the address first before you get to the value. So remember that, okay? So that you can say, oh, if we need the address of something, it's actually easier than getting to the value of that same thing. So do not let the syntax in this case to get in the way to kind of imply, oh, we have to do some extra thing. No, get to, getting to the address is what you really need to do always. Getting to the value is one extra step of dereferencing, okay? So this part has to do with how familiar you are with C++, especially when it gets to uh, structures and pointers. Yes? Reverse the referencing? It is, in a way, because you know, when you, when you dereference using the asterisk you know, operator, you always dereference a, an address. Okay, so you have to start with an address first. Yep. Yeah, in C or C++, you know, we don't get, to, we don't always specify the address and then we say, you know, dereference the address because most of the time in your program, like in the loop, you're referring to the counter. You really just want the value. I don't really care about where it is. I just want the value. So that's why in a high level programming language, syntactically speaking, it's quote unquote, an extra step to get to the address. But when you translate that code into assembly code, you always have to get to the address first before you can get to the value of that thing. It's just notation. It's just notationalized in terms of notation. Um, a high-level programming language, you know, just wants to refer to the value because that's what you want to get to most of the time. The chances of you trying to get to the address of something is usually pretty slim. That's why you know you don't. 
when you specify the name of a variable, it gives you the value. It doesn't give you the address of something because now, because otherwise you end up with billions, you know, lots of the referencing operators. Because most of the time you don't care about the address; you want the ad, you want the value. But in assembly code, we don't have the concept of the value of something, and the label is only talk is only giving you the offset from where the stack pointer points to. So that's why you always get to the address first, and then you compute from that what is the actual value at that address using a load usually. Alrighty, so that's um, kind of what you need to do. Uh, pictures can be helpful. Okay, you know the picture that I drew earlier can be helpful. Um, having a picture of what is on the stack can be helpful. Understanding the two main types of label definitions is really important. We have two different types of offsets. We have the offset to each member inside the structure, and those are all prefixed with the name of the structure as a label. And then we have the offset to local variables or parameters uh, from where the stack pointer points to, and those are all prefixed by the name of the function. So you have to remember to distinguish between those diff two different types of label definitions because both are offsets. The question is offset from what? Okay. Um, I'm just trying to go through my head you know, right now and try to find out you know, what else can be helpful in your exam. Um, bring your writing instruments. Highlighters can be helpful. As I said a little bit earlier, having a post-it, you know, those tiny little post-its can be helpful because you can say, okay, this is the beginning of that control structure. Where's the end of that thing? Same thing. So it makes it a little bit easier to locate it. Um, try to write, you know, in a way that fits in the page. So for people who have a habit of writing really big. You know, hand, have, who have big handwriting characters, you might need to practice a little bit to write small, you know, so that it fits on the line. Um, I think that's about it. I mean, even combined with all the explanation, it took about an hour to do this. So you have 120 minutes in the actual final exam. So how quickly you can reason out all of these things really depends on your familiarity of the concepts. So for those, yeah, go ahead. Okay, it depends on what kind of a question. If it does not relate back to the assembly code, I can probably answer those questions. But if you are asking a question that relates the C code to the assembly code, I cannot answer those. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, yes. So in this case, you know, we are starting with the with, with just one byte past the end of the entire array, and then work ourselves back to the beginning of the array. Yes. So if it is concerning the C code, I can answer those questions, and I will uh, also type it out so that the entire class can see that, because I don't want that information only to be available to the person who asked the question, so the whole class you know, can get that information. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Oh, okay, this is important. Um, for doing the homework assignment, you kind of have to understand how the whole program works by going through GDB and all kinds of stuff. When you're in the exam like this, you don't have to do that. You don't have to understand what the entire program is trying to do. Focus on one statement at a time, one expression at a time, one argument at a time, because that is going to help you focus and not having you to kind of wonder, I wonder what this entire program is going to do. That is of no concern as far as grading is concerned. I do not tell you ahead of time how many. They are sprinkled. The best way to describe it is sprinkled. And it is sprinkled differently <laughs> in each variation of the test. Um, I think uh, typically I have 
I generate hundreds of thousands of variations of the test, even though each class is only 30 people. <laughs> it's just that the mechanism can sprinkle things in a, in a very randomized way. Which, which basically means, you know, if somebody is honest and really just working on his or her or their, their you know, version of the test, it, it's time consuming, you know, as you can tell, okay, it, it needs you to track a lot of things. The moment two people sit down and say, okay, let's compare, what have you got? That is when, you know, things, bad things happen, you know, because, you know, that means, you know, they're going to be, those people will be spending more time than it will take to answer the question just to find out what is different and they, ha they will still end up with no idea of what is right and what is wrong between the versions. It, it, this scheme has no impact to people who are honest. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> because I, I, had, I taught this class when we were still uh, in the pandemic and everything was online. I was teaching this class in a synchronous way, which means you know, um, everybody still has to take the exam within the same time frame, within, within the same two hours. But then I have to you know, make sure that people do not just compare and go like, okay, what have you got? What am I getting? You know, how do we figure out which one is right and which one is wrong? So I have to do the sprinkling you know, in, a, in a way that makes it very difficult for people to compare and go like, okay, so how, even if I know what your test is, you know, how do I kind of map that to mine? You know, that's going to be a lot of extra effort. Okay, anything else? Any other questions that you might have, you know, in terms of helping you to kind of get this done? Okay. It's still open book and open notes, you know, but I would not, okay? You know, if, I were, if I were you, I would not overstudy this one. I would go through it, okay? In other words, you, know, you have this code already. Um, I might not have sent you the C code, but the C code is already in this you know, document here, which I can send you also. Um, you can kind of go through this whole process unless you have a photographic memory and say, oh, I can remember every single place tech did change, make the changes to this program. If you cannot do that, it's like a brand new test to you. So I would kind of go through that process, you know, just to exercise, you know, all the concepts that you have learned about this class and then compare your answer to what we have here just to see whether you catch everything the way that we did in class. Um, and I think all of these would help with your homework assignment. So that means, you know, I would still put higher priority uh, to getting the homework done, even though the point value is low, because even if you cannot get it done, okay, even on Thursday, you know, the program is not working, you're still going through the process of trying to get it done, and that can help you, you know, with, you know, the final exam as well. So I would still do that even if you say, oh, I cannot get the whole thing done. Still, you know, put in the effort because that is studying as well. All right, I still have office hours, okay? So during the final week, I have office hours unless I have a class at the same time, which is from eight to nine, which is only affects, affect this class. I have office hours every day from eight to nine in the morning. So that would be next uh, Friday, this Friday, next Monday, and next Wednesday, and also next uh, Thursday, I think. Because we have an exam on next Tuesday, which is the 12th. So only on that day that the uh, office hours after the exam. Do you guys want me to have office hour like before the exam? Because I can do that. I can be here by 7 a.m. because our exam starts at 8 a.m. on next Tuesday. So does anyone think that you might want to come talk to me an hour or so before the final exam? Okay, let me know if that is what you want to do because currently my, my office hour is scheduled after the exam. Um, but if you say, oh no, the tech, I really want to talk to you before the exam, I can be here by 7 a.m. It's not a problem for me. <laughs> my cat wakes me up you know, by, by 5 or 5.30 a.m. My cat. <laughs> Cats are very good at waking up people. 
Um, so I don't have a problem being here at 7 a.m., okay, if you just have to let me know, because otherwise, usually, I don't get out of the house that early. All right. Anything else? Nope. Okay. So, okay, this is one more thing. If you have not been commenting the sample programs that I've been doing in class, and you want to, you know, get this done, you know, get the final exam done, you know, reasonably well, you might want to do that, okay? Because you're commenting the sample programs that I have written is a way to practice and get ready for the test. All right. So if there are no additional questions, I can stop the recorder and you guys can stay here to work on your program, your Traverse program, or you can go do whatever you want. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna stop the recorder and upload it. I'll see.